What's going on people? Welcome back to my personal channel. Welcome back to another video for you guys today. I hope you guys are still feeling the buzz off that game yesterday against United. I'm not going to lie, I still am. I've had a very long sleep afterwards, but I'm still gassed off the result and the Twitter meltdown as well. I uh, do want to say before I start this video, if you guys haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe to my personal channel. And also don't forget to press the bell notification button to be the first to know whenever I release any new content. Now, Manchester United v Chelsea. Years gone by, it would have been a very favourable game for Chelsea. United used to hate coming down to our ground, but in recent history, the tide has completely turned Manchester United's way. They've won at our ground three times on the bounce. I think they've beaten us three games in a row this season as well going into this match and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was yet to register a loss against Chelsea as well as manager of Manchester United. I was about to fall into a trap of saying as manager but I remember he lost to us at Cardiff. But Manchester United going into this game were going in as clear favourites and Chelsea were going in as the underdogs. But that's just the way we like it. We love going into the game with the odds against us and no one thinking that we're going to do anything and everyone thinking that we're the second base, second favourite team going into it. And we dominated. We comfortably dominated Manchester United for long periods of the game. Lampard with another tactical masterclass. And this is going to be a very fun five talking points for me because I'll be real, I was looking forward to this game. I was really hoping that, just for pride's sake, we weren't going to let Ole beat us four games in a row, just for pride's sake. And I feel like Lampard would be saying that to every one of them in the dressing room. He's like, you lot let us lose to Ole four games in a row. Half of you man are gone. Half of you man are gone straight. So let's go straight into the five talking points. First talking point for me is I have to start with the formation, the 3-4-3. It saved the day yet again. And it's looking like the key formation for us in the big games. There's plenty of games where... We've gone into a big match in shaky form. We've played a much more defensive, a much more calmer formation. And we have a much, there's a, a sense of ease with us when we're on the ball. The playing three at the back allowed each defender to man mark one of the Manchester United um, attackers and take them out of the game. Uh, Jorginho and Kovacic in midfield also allowed us to dominate the midfield and get the best out of both players with their telepathic understanding for each other. And I'm going to build on that point as well later on. And the inclusion of Mason Mount, uh, Willian and Olivier Giroud as our front three attackers allowed us to press very high up the field. And when you got Jorginho and Kovacic in midfield as well, helping with the press, and you got the fullback and you got the wing backs in Reese James and Marcus Alonso supporting both the attack and the defence, we were non stop on these guys. Manchester United didn't have a moment to breathe on the ball. And it was it was the best formation for us at the time. Manchester United, I think, tried to go for a 3 4 2 1, but they just didn't have the same players and the right tools for that formation. Going forward, they didn't offer anything. Uh, Bruno Fernandes never allowed to settle on the ball and that is going to lead nicely into my second point as well and that is that the Jorginho and Kovacic pivot worked wonders yet again. The game plan was always to stop Bruno Fernandes by any means necessary, fair or foul and he did draw a couple fouls to it, uh, while we were trying to do it and a couple of them were rough, a couple of them was just Bruno trying to get fouls for himself but that also kind of worked to our, our advantage because we know what Manchester United are, Barchester United and they always get decisions going their way and they were trying to play that sort of style of play, they were always trying to draw fouls and test the referee's resolve and to be fair that worked just fine for us because we just wanted to stop Manchester United's attack. If they're going to try and go down for fouls, they're going to stop attacking because the attack's been stopped because of the foul. So that slowly started creeping into our game and that started improving us as well because Manchester United barely had a sniff going forward. And I'll say for even Willy Caballero, he didn't have much of a job to do today. Bar the penalty... He really could have got a clean sheet and it feels like the Tottenham at home game where he was just robbed of another clean sheet. But back to the Jorginho and Kovacic pivot, the pressing was amazing. Manchester United, like I said previously, not given any time to breathe on the ball. Jorginho controlled the tempo from deep while Kovacic was the one driving the ball forward. Jorginho as well marshalling the midfield and you can, you can still see him being confident and being vocal to the rest of the players around him. And we thought that was an aspect of his game that was going to dip ever since Lampard started resting him pre-lockdown. But uh, I said about Billy Gilmore's injury and how that might potentially save Jorginho's career. I think the Jorginho Kovacic pivot is another reason why you potentially have to look at keeping Jorginho. Jorginho is still a huge asset to this team. He's very, I'm not going to say one dimensional, but I'll say he's very good at what he does. And limited at everything else. But if you can play the game to his strengths. It's like Olivier Giroud. You play the player to his strengths. You get the best out of the player. And that's the same for Jorginho again. Moving on to my next point. 
big game Giroud striking yet again. And the fight for uh, starting position as striker is going to be very short-lived because Timo Werner is already through the door. But Giroud, in my opinion, has fought his way back into the starting eleven for a third successive season. And his performance today was amazing. His movement in and around the box was always threatening. And in the first half, with very limited opportunities, he was making himself known for Azpilicueta, for Reese James, for Marcus Alonso to whip in them crosses for him as well. He also did his defensive duty as well. He cut out passing lanes very well. He was pressing the defence and De Gea very high up the field and he was rewarded at the end at the end of the first half with his first goal off the Aspel Equator cross and it was deserved. The guy had Maguire on ropes the entire game. Maguire was trying to take his shirt off. Maguire was trying to touch his nipples. Maguire was trying to do everything to try and keep Drude off the ball but Drude was just too strong for him and that's what his 16th goal in 30 appearances and I think Drude's making a big statement for why he deserved that contract back in May or June and I'm just sitting here thinking Imagine if we tried to get rid of this guy in January because in January we didn't do much transfer activity the most thing we were the most movement we were trying to do was trying to push Olivier Giroud out of the club and thank god no club took us up on that offer because imagine if we had to start um the rest of the games post lockdown with an off form Tammy Abraham and Mishi Batshuayi who's basically out the door he weren't even in the lineup for this game which more or less says it all with Batshuayi but we already know he's basically out the door the way it is Olivier Drude's got his 16th goal in 30, in 30 FA Cup appearances and he's a bit of a cup master, you know. It feels like last season with the Europa League final. He loves those cup competitions and I think he's a shoe-in to start for the FA Cup final. I don't think that's a controversial point to make. Drude's yet again, like I said previously, fought his way back into the starting 11. He's... Imagine if we had Olivier Giroud coming on at parts of the first half of the season. We might have picked up a couple more points. He's already a great plan B, but he's shown already right now that he is a great plan A as well if you play to his strengths. Moving on to my fourth point, and as Pill Equator, we need to shout out Cesar as Pill Equator because this has been a completely different as Pill Equator from pre lockdown to post lockdown. And the guy's got a bit more attacking threat in his game. I've, I've mentioned it a couple times before in previous videos but he has really improved his attacking threat and it was there to see for the Manchester United game we put him back in that right center back position where he thrived under Antonio Conte and he had that telepathic link up with Alvaro Morata in the 17-18 season where he actually made him look like a pretty good striker for a couple seasons and that deserves credit on itself because it's Alvaro Morata but he was so good going forward his crosses he tried, the first half, he really tried to find Olivier Drude and it was hard for him because both teams started out with the three defenders at the back and the, and the two wing backs. And that meant that going forward, very little options for either side. But as Equator's crosses were still threatening, they were still finding the right areas of the pitch. Sometimes there weren't a player there, sometimes there was a player but he was surrounded by two or three players. But as Equator was threatening, his crosses were threatening, and that was part of the reason why we were the more dominant side leading into half time. And it was rewarded by the assist for the first goal, the ball into Olivier Drew. As Equator. The guy continues to never disappoint you. I remember January, I was sitting there thinking, Raw Aspi might be declining, you know. I didn't even see this coming, but seriously, the guy's just turned leaps and bounds and he's just surprised us yet again. Mr. Consistency strikes yet again. So yeah, point number four, Aspel Equator now has attacking threat. Point number five, the FA Cup final. It is Arsenal versus Chelsea. Baku 2020 plus a little bit revenge for 2017. Both rolled into one. Personally, this is going to make my year if we get a result in this match. Honestly, you think the United Twitter meltdown was bad? Imagine if we beat Arsenal in the final. But I do not want to gas myself up too much for this. Me putting my hand on my heart. This, the final against Arsenal is going to be bigger and it's going to be a tougher match than the Manchester United game. Or it might be the toughest match of our season because every Arsenal player in that team is going to have Baku in the back of their heads and the embarrassment that was put upon them last year. They are not going to let that happen twice. We are going into Wembley and we are going to go in for a fight. We cannot underestimate Arsenal. We can't think it's going to be a walk in the park just because it's the worst Arsenal team in like how many years or because their record against us has been poor recently or because you think Baku might be on their heads. That's just going to motivate them. That really is just going to motivate them. So my only point here is do not underestimate Arsenal. 
Because if we do that, it's going to be shades of 2017 again. Do you remember 2017 where we had lifted the league the week before? Everyone was getting gas. Players were having parties and everything. We were thinking it was going to be an easy game. We should have lost that final 7-1. No, 6-1. And I mean that with my chest. If Arsenal had better finishes that day, if Cahill didn't clear, I think Welbeck's chance off the line, if Ramsey didn't have a shot, I think go to the other side of the post or hit the post, if Bellerin didn't miss a chance after they went 2-1 up or Meza Ozil, we would have got embarrassed. We would have got so embarrassed. And we were down to 10 men as well. So my fifth point, do not underestimate Arsenal. Take them seriously. We can beat them. But only if we've got the right mentality for it. If we go there thinking it's going to be a walk in the park, we're going to get embarrassed again. So, guys, this is the end of my five talking points. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my talking points or any of my opinions down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Carefree Lewis G. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care and up the chills.